Remember to turn the... Welcome everyone. I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us. We're gonna give it a minute and let everybody come into the room. Once you're <clears> in, <throat> um, if you could mute, make sure you mute yourself. And uh, that would be extremely helpful because otherwise the attention will be turned from the archbishop to your muttering in the background. So that's not a, a good experience for everyone. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a bunch more in the waiting room. Let's bring them in. Okay, and then let's begin. So thank you. Uh, my name is Maggie Gallagher. I'm the executive director of the Benedict 16th Institute for Sacred Music and Divine Worship. We were founded by Archbishop Cordelioni with a mission of primarily encouraging and sustaining more beautiful and reverent liturgy and energizing a Catholic culture of the arts. And um, so with no further ado, again, I'm gonna ask everyone, there's so many people joining that mute all is not gonna work. So I'm just gonna ask everyone to please mute themselves and except for the uh, participants. And I'm not sure why, oh, let me see, one second. The speaker's view, something happened to Frank. I don't know what, but Archbishop uh, Cordelioni, could you begin with, uh, with a prayer on this great feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe? Yes, thank you, Maggie. This is certainly a very beautiful day. Um, so we have a special mass today for Our Lady of Guadalupe and uh, those who are kind of liturgical nerds might know that about five years ago in the US, we issued a Spanish Missal. The new translation in English came out 11 years ago, uh, five years ago, the Spanish. And I noticed that the Spanish Missal has a proper preface. The preface is that part of the mass right after the Holy Holy and before everyone kneels down for the uh, rest of the Eucharistic prayer and the consecration. So the Messal added a special preface specifically for Our Lady Guadalupe. So I'd like to pray from that and then also the collect the opening prayer for the Mass today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, Father, Almighty and Eternal, it is our duty and our salvation to give you thanks always and everywhere because in your unbounded goodness, you have willed that the mother of your son, under the title of Guadalupe, be our mother as well in a special way, that she be our refuge and our lady, a living presence in the history of your people. She is the messenger of your goodness and the maternal sign of your love, who has held out to us compassion and is always there to help us and defend us. And now she invites us to be reconciled with you and among ourselves, and to proclaim the gospel of your son, so that fraternity and peace may flourish in our land. Lord God, you are the Father of mercies, who placed your people under the singular protection of your son's most holy mother. Grant that all who invoke the Blessed Virgin of Guadalupe may seek with ever more lively faith the progress of peoples and the ways of justice and peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Before we go into this, I'm, I'm really very excited about this discussion of the new insights generated by the book written by Joseph and Monique Gonzalez, which is called Guadalupe... And I just blanked on it. What is it called, Monique? Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, How God Prepared the Americas for Conversion Before the Lady Appeared. I, I've been involved in this book uh, the, tangentially for uh, several years, and I'm very excited to be at last able to see the completed project, product, um, and hope that it will bring many more new people to Our Lady. Archbishop, uh, maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about whatever you'd like to, about your relationship with Our Lady of Guadalupe, what you think we should be thinking about on this or feast day. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think we're all aware about um, the power of this apparition to Juan Diego. I, I'm pleased to see how the devotion to her in our own country, the United States, has grown so much in the, the last few decades. So I can remember I, I entered the seminary in the 1970s, and so I became more knowledgeable and aware of our Lady Guadalupe then, but she wasn't that well. And she was heard about, but not really that well that well known, and there wasn't the great um, devotion then as there is now. But I've noticed this has grown more and more over the years as people begin to realize this isn't just a, a cultural uh, manifestation of Our Lady that connects with one race or nationality, but it, it, she is truly, as all Marian apparitions are, a gift to the whole world. And I, if you even notice, even around the world, people have told me that in parts of Africa now there's a great devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe. It truly is a singular event in the history of the church with the, um, when we think about the bloodshed, right, of the conquistadores and then the human sacrifices of the Aztec people and, and the bloody conflict and how she brought about the peace and reconciliation that we pray for in the mass texts today and uh, brought the two together as one, creating this, a new Christian civilization. It's and uh, I understood some things about how the apparition tied into the indigenous culture of the Aztec people, but uh, I understand much better now that I'm beginning to learn from uh, the Gonzaleses about the flower prophecies and and how even how much more deeply God was preparing this people, almost like a second chosen people. I think you make a good point about how God prepared the Hebrew people. Uh, for the coming of the Messiah who came for the whole world. In a way, God has he chose the Aztec people with in their own culture to prepare for the uh, appearance of her, of his son's mother, who then gave birth again to her son by giving birth to this new Christian civilization. So um, thank you so much for this research, and I'm looking forward to learning more about it. All right. Well, Joseph and Monique, first of all, why don't you tell us just briefly about yourselves? Joseph, you're a composer. Yes, I'm a composer. I worked 30 years in Hollywood, uh, working in the TV industry, scoring movies and, and documentaries, but also had a parallel uh, career where I was writing music for string quartets, choirs, symphony orchestras. And back way back in the early 1990s, uh, I had this idea to write a piece of music with Aztec song poetry, and that's what actually led us to that. But um, I'll just stop there for now, and Monique can introduce herself. Hello, I'm Monique Gonzalez. I'm from the Los Angeles area. I've studied classical voice, um, went through a conversion at a certain point, and part of my conversion was very specifically with Our Lady of Guadalupe. And when I came back to Los Angeles and I met Joseph, he pulled me into this other aspect of her that I had never encountered before by introducing me to me to the song poems. So uh, also Monique, uh, your last name is Gonzalez. That's a married name, right? Yes. So you're, uh, you're, 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 you're a Mexican American, right? Joseph. Joseph is. Yes. yes. Monique and what, what, what is your, what is your, what? Uh, I'm Mexican American. I'm predominantly Filipino and and then a little bit of Mexican and German mixed in. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's begin with what needs to be explained. Can you describe what, I mean, these Franciscan missionaries were there working very hard, mm -hmm not having an enormous amount of luck, very small number that happened also in the, in North America. It was a lot of effort. Um, and then what happened? What did she talk about the Nicomopoa and how it links to the okay. world? So what happened was in December 9th of 1531, uh, a humble commoner, Masahual, by the name of Christian name of St. Juan Diego, is walking by the hill of Tepeyac. And the moment he's walking by, he's swept into a paradisal realm that's emitting tons of light. And he's surrounded by music. His entire env environment is, is shimmering with music and with color and light. And he's so astonished. The very first thing he says is, 
could I be worthy? Could I be worthy of what I hear? Which is a very key line that we'll get to in a quick in a quick second. But then the very second thing is he says, could I be in the place my ancient ancestors spoke of in Shoshit Lalpan and Donakat Lalpan, the flower world paradise, in the land of heaven? And the moment he says this, he connects himself with a very ancient indigenous belief system that's centered around this solo floral paradise um, that very recently scholars have discovered in the last 20 to 30 years and they've been delving further into that so we're going to kind of let, let, let me let me pause that. a minute because the the i want to step back a minute sure and because this is part of the explanation for how powerful this apparition was but mm -hmm. can you start by telling us how powerful it was what happened after our lady of guadalupe appeared well, very quickly after she appeared within less than seven to 10 years, we have nine to 10 million souls that came into the church, um, pretty much comparable to the, the amount of souls that left the church during that same century, even in that those, those 20 years after Luther posted his thesis on the door in Germany, that same amount came in, which is a very unusual thing to do because normally when cultures come to Christianity, it normally takes hundreds of years for them to get some kind of a sense of Christianity. And yet what we see in Mesoamerica is a very quick um, possession of a deep, sincere, authentic Christian uh, faith where they're willing to give up their idols that they had been hiding from the priests prior to that. They're giving up their extra wives that they refused to let go of prior to that point, um, letting go of freeing slaves, paying restitution, and going above and beyond to do penance and reparation for uh, things they wouldn't even admit were sins prior to that point. All of a sudden, they were very clear that they were sins and wanted to become baptized. It's kind of amazing that you in the in Guadalupe and the flower world prophecy, you quote the eyewitness account of Fray Toribio, who said, the people who came were so many that if I had not seen it with my own eyes, I should not dare to mention it. In truth, it was an enormous multitude that came. For besides the sound, there were many lame and crippled and women with children on their backs and old, mare, and, uh, old men, white haired and of great age. And they came from a distance of two or three days journey asking to be baptized. Yes, it was it was a huge shift. Um, just before that, um, the, the Franciscan friars arrived around 1524, and there was actually a dialogue that was recorded between the indigenous and the um and 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 the Franciscans. And just to cut to the chase, it it did not go well. There were so many uh miscommunications. There were concepts that were so foreign to what it was just two completely different worlds. And then seven years later in 1531, when Guadalupe appeared in the decade that followed, it was a complete turnabout. And we go in our book and we specifically say specific concepts that were implanted at the very beginning of Mesoamerican civilization. We're talking about 1500 BC here, took about 300 years to 1500 AD. 3000 years. 3000 years, excuse me, to develop over time. And right just a few decades before, in fact, 1490, there was a recorded uh, a meeting of these song po poets, and we'll get into the flower song poems a little bit. Yeah, yeah they were, yeah, they yeah. were contemplating. It was just right before this happened, so uh, before Guadalupe appeared. So it's very providential. So definitely, so Archbishop, I remember in your um, homily for the Mass of the Americas in San Francisco, it's a you know a well known saying, but he hath done this for no other nation. So maybe you could, it, it, it really is a kind of extraordinary conversion event, unlike anything we've seen before or since in human history, it, especially coming as it were from, so the, anyway, anyway, I don't know if you wanna jump in on that point. Yes, uh, non fecitaliter omni nazioni, he has not done this with any other nation. The story goes that um, this was, a. Uh, when uh, one of the missionaries returned from Mexico and he brought one of the first reproductions of the image of Our Lady Guadalupe to Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, So this is in the middle of the uh, 18th century. And he explained the image and he explained what happened in the wake of the image. 
And then he quoted that line from Psalm 147, which of course is in reference to, uh, in light of the Gonzalez's observation, what I'll call the first chosen people of God, uh, that uh, God has not done that with any other nation, re chosen them to be his own and reveal to them this higher law. Uh, so likewise, God has not done this with any other nation, uh, that his mother would appear in this way and, and then bring so many souls to her son. So um, jo Joseph and Monique, European scholars for a number of years just missed a lot. For, part of it was not really available generally scholarly. So the flower world prophecy was not translated out of Nahuatl, not a language many European scholars know uh, in, until 1985. So this information wasn't available. And then when it became available, the the most scholars adopted a what I would call a hermeneutic of suspicion, meaning they assumed that God wasn't real. And so the the testimony of the flower world prophecies was uh, dismissed. Can you take us through what you discovered as you you started as an artist setting to music uh, some of the song poems from the flower world prophecies? Tell us the trail that you followed and where it led. Well, back in the early 1990s, when I decided to write this piece of music, uh, I had to do a lot of research. I happened to be living in downtown LA at the time. So I would walk over to the LA Public Library and started, I, I quickly discovered that there was about 180 known song poems that had been collected by the Franciscan friars around 1560s, okay? And of those song poems, there's a subgenre called flower song poems. Now, these flower song poems are the ones where they talk about beauty and philosophy and beauty, truth, and goodness. And we'll get into that in a little bit, I'm sure. But what happened is that uh, one of these collections is called the Cantares Mexicanos, referring to the Mexica people, otherwise known as the Aztecs. So I looked at these 90 poems. I read the very first poem, which is the primary flower song. It's actually called the origin of the songs, Huica Pecayot in Nahuatl. And I read this story of a singer who's looking for flowers. He's asking the butterflies and the, and the hummingbirds where he can find the flowers. And his primary reason was to find the flowers he can put in his, in his tilma so we can bring them down the mountain and show them to the lords and princes. So right away, I think people can kind of see the, the parallel. This is an earlier song poem. This isn't the Juan Diego story. So it so when when you look, when you put the two side by side, you see the same phrases in Nahuatl. Even the two birds that are mentioned are the same species of birds. I mean, what are the chances, right? So at and the you time. That very specific, that Juan Diego, when he's immersed in the apparition, literally says, could this be the flower world that my ancestors prophesied or something very yes. similar to that? Exactly. Yes. I mean, he, Juan Diego himself, he felt like he was speaking to us. He was actually pointing us on this journey. From saying his, from his first words, from his yes. first words, you know, what? why would he say the place that our ancient ancestors spoke of? So anyway, but unfortunately at that time, see Juan Diego canonization started in 1996. And I read this poem in the early 1990s. And as you said, this book had just been published in 1985. Okay, so, and that was the first translation of these song poems in any language. So this, this is all new scholarship. By the way, the the publication in Spanish of that came out just barely came out in 2011. So th this is this is all new. So, song poems, yeah. so anyway, what happened though is that when I read the, uh, I turned to the back of the book to see what, what, why is this so similar? What's going on? The author John Beerhor said, "Well, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. This song poem, because it sounds so familiar to the Guadalupe story." is obviously the source material for a fabricated, meaning false, Guadalupe narrative. Because in the scholastic world, everything about Guadalupe is false. Everything is fabricated. That's pretty much what we have found out. 
So, and the reason I had to bring this up is because the, really the material about Guadalupe really started when in 1996, when when Juan Diego was was going to be canonized. That's when a bulk of the material came out. So I was just a few years before that. So I looked you around. Missed I missed I missed it by a few years. So what I just saw was everybody saying it's fabric. It's it's a it's, made it's a hoax. It's made it's, up. And to tell you the truth, it it really did hurt my faith. I I thought, whoa, this is the smoking gun. But everything changed in 2009 when I met Monique and. Maybe we should let Monique tell her story because it's super important to this turnaround <laughs> that happened with us. Well, I think because of my own conversion, the way I came to my conversion was by asking a ton of questions and kind of challenging God and then having God come back and showing me through different people and different texts, the truth of who he was, I kind of assumed that it would be the same with this. So when Joseph handed me the book and said, uh, can you help me find some song poems? Because he wanted to add some piece, more pieces of music to that concert piece he was telling you about. And I read that first poem. And then I turned to Joseph and said, what in the world is this? Why does it sound so much like the Guadalupe story? It was at that point we started, we started asking all the questions and saying, you know, maybe together we can figure this out. Let's, let's dig a little bit. Let's pull out the different books and find out everything that's been written and see what the scholars say and just really examine it honestly. And it started this 14 year, what we call our wonderful obsession um, that's and it finally has paid off in the book that now exists today and you can purchase. But it took a long time to reach that point. So let, let's let's take people a little more deeply into the flower world prophecy because I think that's extremely moving. So, oh wow, I just lost my show notes here. Here we go. Um, so this very first preeminent song poem, the origin of song, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And the protagonist is simply called the singer. He has no name. Mm -hmm. And you write in Crisis Magazine, I think I put the link up. He longs to find beautiful, precious flowers so he can show them to princes and his lordly friends. And the very first line reveals what his quest is. Where could I get some good, sweet flowers? And then he goes around asking, who does he ask this question to? He, he asks, says, where can I find some flowers? He asks, the Quetzal hummingbird. He, he asks all the other birds and the butterflies, all of the the, the winged um, uh, creatures in this environment. He's asking, and 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 they're, none of them are able the to. Winged than the singers. The singers, the singers of the environment, were all swirling around him. He's asking them, but a golden hummingbird steps forward and tells him, "Follow me. Let me lead you into." And Shoshi in Shoshi Tlalpan, Into Nakapan, the exact same phrase that Juan Diego says at the beginning of the Guadalupe encounter. Mm -hmm. yes. And yeah. so once when the, the hummingbird does that and he, he sees these precious flowers or seemingly sees them and then seemingly gathers them in his tilma. And, and he bursts into down. song, right? He bursts into a song of praise. Yes. Who does yes. he praise? The God of far and near. In Floken Nawake, that's the term for the God so, of far and near. His creator, basically, the, the, the God of all creation in their conception. Yes. And, and so, then, so it seems like a very happy story is going on. He seeks paradise. He finds the flowers of paradise. Yeah. And then what happens? He realizes he didn't actually go. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe it was a vision. We're not entirely sure, but we do know he was pulled away from that incredibly gorgeous place. And he starts crying. He's like, well, I, could, I wish I could go back there. I wish I could take, possess those intoxicating sweet flowers. And But he does also tell us why he couldn't. He says it's because I am, well, how could one who was worthless and afflicted and who sins on earth possess those flowers? Thankfully for us, he also gives an out for that. And he says that only the God of far and near in Tloke Nawake can make one worthy of those flowers. But until that point happens, he, he just has to wait in silence and and, and, and tearing and, and hunger, hoping that someday he, someone could get him. To the but you part. say it ends on a note of complete and utter despair. He does not see, he has glimpsed paradise and he sees no way to get into it. He's Is completely that? torn away, yes. Exactly. And, and if I might add, you know, these, these types of stories where, the singer who's representing all man, who wants to go to a paradisal realm, but is it is denied. 
is your classic paradise a lost story. Now, this is very common in the pagan world. It's a way in which pagan man can explain the, the lost world, the failed world in which he lives. It's a very, very common trope. The, the, uh, the, the singer in this case has a quest that he's trying to find and trying to gain something but he doesn't find it. In this case, he's the hero, the protagonist, but he's the failed hero. He's the tragic hero. He's not the victorious or redeeming hero. hero. So these are very important things. They may seem like um, throwaway little stories, but you know these myths define cultures, define individuals. Jung talks about it. Jordan Peterson talks about it. All these different people say that our stories are really important so the- to them, to us. So, you you know, not only the roses that were not native to the region and the sweet smells and being surrounded by music, but you say the very image left on the tilma speaks to the connection for people who were raised in the Aztec culture with the flower world prophecies. Can you tell us a little more about that? Right. Uh, Well, you know, in our book, we don't we don't necessarily go into the tilma because uh, there's been so many excellent books that have written about that. We only kind of pertain to focus in on the four petal flower, a very small four petal flower, which is over her womb. And I'm going to have to really back up, if you don't mind, because there's a lot of explanation. I'll try to be really short, uh, uh, short with that. Um, Essentially, the four petal flower goes all the way back to the. Olmec middle formative period, which is 1500 BC, you start to see in uh, in archaeological ruins concepts of a four petaled flower or or things arranged in in four with the center point. This is representative of the axis mundi. The four directions are actually north, south, east, and west. If you impose a flower over it, it has four petals, north, south, east, and west, which is representing the beauty that we find in the known universe. The earthly plane. The earthly plane. But there's a center point that goes up from that middle point, like a three-dimensional model. That center point goes up to the place of divine beauty, the place of ultimate truth the place where the where we get a glimpse of earthly beauty. So the flower, especially the four petaled flower becomes a symbol for a connection between beauty, between earthly beauty and heaven. So we that's just the very beginning. It's a transcendental, it's beauty, truth and goodness. That, and we trace it through our books because not only does it start in the Olmec period, but it continues on. We see it through the Maya period. We see it through the Teotihuacan period. And we see how these concepts develop. Eventually, we see them in the flower song poems. And that's where it gets very deep, very philosophical. To cut to the chase, the flower is a symbol for truth. In fact, in 1492, 90, which I just alluded to, just a decades before Cortez came, the poets of the Nawa came together and they wanted to contemplate beauty, truth, and goodness mm-hmm. through their flower song poems. And they came to the conclusion that flowers are the only truth on earth. Okay. So the so the singer is trying to gather the flowers of truth. The flowers of truth, ultimate truth. He wants to, he wants to hold it in his in his tilma. But he can't just hold it, just like any hero story. He must share it with the people of the earth, just like Beowulf or Gilgamesh epic, where Grendel has to carry the head of the monster. It's called Return with Elixir, a la Joseph Campbell and the Man with the Thousand Faces or the Hero's Journey. So... It, it 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 fits. It's this long meta narrative yeah. that goes I'm sorry, through. Sorry, you're freezing. Still, there you go. Okay. That that eventually takes us to Juan Diego, who finds the flowers, but also we see the four petaled flower over her womb. Mm-hmm. Actually, if if you see it as a two dimensional image, okay, the on, four petals, on, on the tilma, you have to kind of in. see it as as a three dimensional image where actually the center point is leading you to ultimate truth, is leading you to ultimate beauty, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. And so um, you say that the, so this is, this is the puzzle. How does a private revelation from a peasant about a Marian apparition suddenly 
lead to millions of people saying, yes, yes, I want to be baptized. Can you describe for us your what you found about what you know now know about how that happened? Okay. Well, the way that we have to explain it in the book is we say that there were four primary, we call them the conceptual pillars that were that were laid out, which is like a part one that had to be laid out, a foundation, which is part of this um, thing called, called okay. evangelical preparation. Okay. And um, we lay that out, how it's happened all over the world, but it, and why couldn't it happen here in the Americas, okay? So we follow four main concepts, the transcendentals, beauty, truth, and goodness. Number two, life after death. And in this case, it's life after death in this paradisal floral realm, okay? A three is a concept of a one supreme God. That's extremely important. It was important to the Greeks. It was important to... Augustine, it was important to Thomas Aquinas, the idea of a first cause or a supreme God, one supreme God. And the fourth one is worthiness, okay? So we track these concepts all the way across, and we and what we begin to see is that right before Guadalupe appears in the Nahua culture, the pagan Aztec culture, we see fully developed concepts, albeit pagan, versions of these four concepts. And they were firmly ingrained in the people of, of Mesoamerica. They had a whole system of, of memorizing these philosophical poems that would have gone out to village to village. They, they would have been performed in the public uh, square. In fact, one of our writers says, it's like philosophizing in the open air. Mm -hmm. That's That's what used to happen, believe it or not. And that's the way these ideas of Transcendental ideas would have been transmitted. Okay, so anyway, when the missionaries come, they present the Christian version of these four concepts. And the way we explain it, yeah, we get a little bit dramatic, but in but when we get to chapter seven and we talk about right before Guadalupe appears to Juan Diego in that early morning on December 9th, we've got two very, very firm ideas. We have a pagan concept and we have a Christian concept. And it just never seemed like they were ever going to meet. But through the Guadalupe story, through the concepts, the ones that we've sort of been talking about right now, it, it, caused, it created a bridge of understanding. It created a bridge for the Nahua people to be able to go from the, this earlier song uh, of the Cuicapecayo, the origin of the songs, they were able to cross over through the account of Guadalupe so that they made sense. They could, the, the, and the stories were connected, the origin of the songs and the Guadalupe narrative. They read like an entire story as opposed to just being one part of a story. When you put them together, they fit like a puzzle. Right. Uh, so they created a bridge for the, for the Nawa. But, but you, you point out that it changed the Nahuatl people's understanding of themselves from being a people unworthy of paradise, right? So t tell me a little more about, about that aspect. She's talking about the redeeming hero. Well, what happened is that the when you, when you have a culture where the predominant myth is that of a failed hero, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect the way that you see yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to see yourself as an unworthy person, a person who is unworthy to go to the flower world paradise. And here might be an interesting point for, for our audience here tonight. In the account, Juan Diego is referred to as a masajual, which is commonly uh, translated as a commoner or a peasant, right? There's actually a deeper meaning to it. Masakwal actually means a person who is unworthy to go to the flower world paradise. So Juan Diego is introduced in his language as a person who will is who's not worthy who's to go. not worthy to go to the flower world paradise. And just kind of a bit of a spoiler alert that perhaps explains why when he steps into this flowery realm at the beginning of the Guadalupe narrative, the very first thing he asks himself is, "Am, Am I, I worthy, worthy of what I hear?" Because he knows that he, as a Masa Wall, should not, not be, be in the flower world paradise. But what is the major difference? Juan Diego is a baptized Christian. Mm. He's a devout baptized Christian who is walking close to 14 miles 
to go to mass that morning to receive the sacraments. That is the big difference. And we think that that point, the fact that he was a baptized Christian would have meant everything. everything. It changes the entire paradigm. It now means that the, that heaven to live in eternity with your creator is now available to anyone who wants it. And that's where we're saying they came in droves. They came by the millions because they had been craving this flower world paradise for so many decades, centuries, millennia. And now they had a way sudden, able to be to able to, to go there, but they had to find their nearest priest and they had to get baptized. Mm -hmm. But paradise can be yours through the sacrifices of Jesus Christ at last. Yes. 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 And that's how they understood it. Uh, Frank LaRocca, our composer in residence, do you want to say hello so you pop up on our screen? Because I think, it, you know, you're re in the middle of reading it, and I'd love to hear your, your take on the book <clears throat> and the theories. Hello, everyone. Yes, um, I am about a third of the way through the book, although the book is, this is, this, this published version is not my introduction to their book. I was privileged to be with them on the last few years of this journey and to see some of the um, earlier manuscripts and to learn so much from Joseph and Monique um, about an event <clears throat> in New World Christian history that played that that has deep personal meaning uh, for me, and so I'm about a third of the way through the book, and they're they're going through after introducing the concepts, they're now going through in detail the four pillars that Joseph just described, and the first pillar is, and perhaps, they, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find the page right away. Oh yes, the first pillar is the only truth on earth. And it's a description of the life and experience of these song poets who are religious seekers and artists and who firmly believe that the songs that, that they compose, they do not create out of an act of their own will, but rather they are vessels that receive these songs from the source of all divine beauty. And just just the way the way that they describe it, it was it was riveting. It was thrilling. It was not <laughs> well, Joseph. I can say this along with you. Dare I say a somewhat familiar experience? Because yes, there are those parts when you're composing something. There are those parts where you're just sort of you're getting through on your skill, your technique, your training, your um, your ability, your just your technique. Um, but then there are those moments or those pieces where it seems like it just it just came to you. You can't do anything wrong. All you have to do is just kind of listen and it's there. And that's that's the kind of experience that they're describing in that uh, for those song poets in that first pillar. And I found it um, I I knew exactly what, what they meant, and it was beautiful and thrilling to read. Well, you know, if I, if I may, you know, Frank, as, as fellow composers, you know, we, we've spent, we've had many discussions about composing, but that is something that I know that we both relate to, is, is the idea of being, especially in the realm of sacred music, of being right. vessels uh, for God to <laughs> kind of beam down ideas and to go into that place that place where you are experiencing the sacred and uh also you know when you're performing or you're singing gregorian chant or something you 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 feel it you 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 say whoa i'm here 
I'm in that place, even though I know I'm here on earth. It's but a strange experience. I mean, Monique has yeah, been there all too. All the time, yes. Where you're, you're in the middle of prayer. You, you're, you're experiencing prayer. You become prayer in that moment. It's a very strange experience. Right. Yeah. And and what we were taking, you know, we 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 read so many different books. Uh, in particular, this this writer named Miguel Leon Portilla, who really got, who really kind of started Nahua philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, he and he talks about flower and song, and he's not. I don't not not sure if he's a musician or not. But what we were like taking, it. with his explanation of what the Nawa were experiencing, it seemed as if that's what we go through as musicians and singers and composers and artists. So, so we kind of put ourselves into the writing to be able to try to explain it better. And you did extremely well. It okay. Was, it was- the Archbishop has to leave. He has to go bring Christ to his people on the altar next door at the cathedral. Archbishop, do you want to say uh, uh, anything as you as you go? We'll miss you. I know you'd love to stay, but Christ calls. Well, uh, already what I had learned, uh, the little bit that I received information, uh, helped me in my my homily this year for Our Lady Guadalupe <laughs> with the, these great uh, new insights. And I remembered about this, the aspect of the unworthiness that the previous story that uh, I forgot the name he he was he was lamenting that he was not worthy mm-hmm. to be in the flower paradise that mm-hmm. it would take uh, a divine being the god of near and far the, a divine being to make him worthy and this is exactly our Catholic theology right yes, that yes. It yes makes us worthy it's not Luther had a different theology that we remain unworthy but he. He um, he allows us. He acquits us anyway. Um, but in our Catholic theology, Christ actually makes us worthy. We have this whole theology of merits that we build up these merits, but it's always through the merits of Christ in union with Him. So uh, it fits. This is another amazing blending of the two cultures and religious imaginations that the, even the theology blends together there. So mm-hmm. can't wait to learn more. So thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You, your, excellency. Bless your excellency. Thank you. Pray. We're praying for right. you. Um, and there's a lot of thank yous for the Archbishop on his way out. Thank you. Um, yes. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the good news about the book. I um, your First little piece of information. I was at an event in Washington, D.C., a gala, and I was sitting next to Charlie McKinney, who is the uh, publisher of the book, the president of Sophia Institute Press. And I asked him how the book was doing, because it was just out. And he said, well, it's doing okay. We sold a couple thousand copies. You know, it's, you know, in the top hundred or so. And fast forward, that was December 7th. Now, on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, what can you report about how the book's doing out there? Well, um, as of about two or three hours ago, uh, uh, Amazon gave us the uh, bestseller label. Um, oh, wow. So I guess it's officially a bestseller. And we keep on saying, are we now bestselling also, can authors? Can we claim that now? <laughs> I don't know. But um, we're, we're just humbled and honored, and uh, it, it's doing really well. And we're looking at the comments of interviews we've given, and it seems as if the light bulb is going off and people are seeing which what we hope to God. happen, yeah. what God has done for the people of the Americas. Yes, and how he wanted to reach out to them and how he wanted to speak to them Mm -hmm. and bring it, bring them to him. Uh, And it's the message seems to be getting out and we're really happy about that. I know Joy Hebink, who is a faithful supporter and attends many of our events is online. Joy, can you pop up and say, unmute yourself and say something? Cause I want to ask you about another little bit of news. I know the archbishop, he just said he used things that he learned from the, the, the really the media about the book. He hasn't read it yet for his homily on the feast for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Joy, are you there? Can you say something? Let me see if I can find you, Joy. Because it was Rish, you emailed me earlier today, and I think it would be 
very interesting news to share, but maybe she had to go. So I see anyway, Joy. I see Joy. see Joy. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Joy. There, there, good. There okay. you are. Hi, Joy. How are you? <laughs> Welcome. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is really fascinating. I um just a word about myself. I um have a PhD in um religion, scripture, and interdisciplinary art history. This kind of thing drives me crazy and with excitement. Um, and now in my retirement, I decided I wanted to move to the, I could move anywhere just to be able to pray well and to be inspired by beautiful liturgy and, and good theologians. So I moved to a couple miles from the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I can see the shrine from my windows, actually. And wow. um, Cardinal Work has been here um, in recent days. He preached at the Rorate Chele Mass on Saturday morning and uh, again today at um, the noon Mass. And, and in both cases, he referenced how pleased he is that this book has come out, that it's opening up connections that we've needed to see and it's just a breath of fresh air he was very complimentary and and referred to it also encouraging people to continue to learn about this that it's not just kind of done you know but it's growing uh, yeah we should well, put up we'll you. send the people are asking about how to get the book i think that went into the waiting room and i don't know monique if you could Stick that link in the chat box so people can sure. buy it and learn more about this. Um, if that's possible, it would be great. Otherwise, we'll send the link Thank afterwards you. to everyone who registered. Thank you, Joy. I just thought they'd like to hear about how Cardinal uh, Burke is using their book in yeah, his homilies really, and encouraging really people to learn more. So yeah. that's really kind of a, a fun note to end on. And we do have it in the chat book that box now if you'd like to know. But you can just get it on Amazon. Um, if you don't want to get it from the Sophia Institute. Uh, I think the Sophia Institute, though, is offering 25. They, once it hit the bestseller, yes. they, they said they're giving yeah. everyone 25% off. So that's probably a better way to buy it, um, better for the publisher, too, and the authors. So um, uh, the uh, the... I know you have a deep, I mean, you have multiple, like you're a human being, so you have multiple motivations. You have an intellectual interest. Monique, you said that's part of the way you engage religiously is with the intellect. And um, that's very clear with Joseph too. But fundamentally, what do you hope to accomplish? What's the end goal of taking a decade or 15 years of your life and writing this book? What would you like to be different in the world? A deeper understanding, at least for me, of, of what the kind of mother Mary is. I mean, that's really what attracted me to Mary was understanding her maternity. And this has really deepened my understanding of her as a mother on a level that I didn't think I would ever understand. And it transforms you. It transforms you as a human being and my daily life. I, I relate to God differently because of what she's been impressing upon me. So I I really think that a lot of the confusions that occur, they can be resolved within that sort of nest is what I call it. Um, if we can just allow ourselves to let her form us to become the people that God wants us to become, things can change drastically if we just give in to that. That's mine in particular. Joseph? Right. I would say that, you know, that would a project, this project that started uh, something that hurt my faith, eventually has helped my faith immensely, primarily because you could I could see God's hand through history. You could see how God, e even for the Aztecs, you know, we, we, a lot of times people think of the Aztecs that that, that they were perhaps not deserving of 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 to be worthy or, or 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 christian to to accept christianity they god 
specifically was reaching out to them and all the people of Mesoamerica. He went through so much trouble to reach out to them. Um, and by all this prefigurement and uh, prophecy and everything else that we're talking about in this book. And of course, the question then becomes, why would God not be doing that for us today? Why would God not be pro perhaps presenting breadcrumbs uh, for, for us today, and especially in dark times mm -hmm. where we think that all is dark and despair, and we perhaps God is setting things up for us for the for the Christian message to be victorious. And that's one thing. So we say that God is in control of history. But if I may, I just want to bring up another point, which I think is super important to this entire uh, discussion. You know, when we started giving talks, we started presenting our hypothesis to different uh, people, different audiences. More often than not, we would get in the Q&A section, we would get somebody coming in and saying, you know, when I was a young girl going to college in Mexico City, so many times I was told that Guadalupe was a myth, was a fabrication. And it hurt me because I my, I and my family had a devotion to Guadalupe. So to hear this professor tearing it down, it really hurt me. Mm -hmm. I, was, mm -hmm. I was in tears when I heard this, but I, I didn't have anything to say. I didn't have anything anything to come mm -hmm. back to him. So what we're hoping we could also accomplish with this book mm -hmm. is the ability to give mm -hmm. ammo, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we we have to be able to explain our faith. We have to give reasons yes. for our faith. We, and we're hoping Especially that- for the for the youth, they're getting bombarded with what's happening in the world today and they don't have an intellectual um, ammunition to kind of fight back against it. So that was 100% a part of our motivation. Right. So- you know, if in a few minutes, we're going to uh, get a taste of the flower world paradise uh, ourselves through the combined talent of our composer in residence, Frank LaRocca, and the lovely, wonderful, ethereal, haunting voice of Anselm Decker, who worked with Frank this summer to record at St. Michael's Abbey, Frank's Ave Maria, which is the Ave Maria in Nuatal. And I thought it would be a great uh, conclusion to this. But before we get to that, I'd like to take some questions from the audience. And we got some, but if you have more, put them in the chat box and I'll start going through them. Anthony says that in 2007, Pope Benedict said the addressing the bishops in Latin America and the Caribbean, that natives were silently longing for Christ without realizing it. And some people objected to that, I guess some people always object. Would you say that, here's this question though, would you say that this book is actually evidence that they were not in fact silently longing, they had vocalized their longing, the desire for salvation or heaven is recorded in these flower prophecies? We would say absolutely yes, it was not silent at all. They wrote numerous song poems expressing their craving for this flower world paradise. Yeah. Right. You, I mean, you could even say that the evidence of flower world, the four petaled flowers that you find in Guatemala, mm -hmm. that you find in pottery shards. In Teotihuacan uh, and Chichen Itza. It's a all an expression of that. A depiction of flower mountain that's in the murals outside of Teotihuacan. Actually, they just recently found underneath the pyramids, the pyramid of the sun and the pyramid of the plume serpent, a four petaled or a four chambered cave, which they are now saying is this four petaled flower, this connection between heaven and earth. You could almost say that Mesoamerican man was obsessed mm -hmm. with the flower world paradise. They built a whole city, Teotihuacan, with that intent in mind, they believe now. Exactly. So, yeah. And one quick thing, they, they actually used to perform this dance called the Masa Kalitzli <laughs> dance, where they would warble and they would cry and they would mm -hmm. scream. And it was all about worthiness. So to say that they were not concerned with this, it, you, you pretty much make it a case that they were obsessed with okay. this. So no, they wanted eternity. They wanted the flower world paradise. I, I, I go back to, I mean, what I found so moving is that the origin of all song, the origin of all art, I, probably not of all art, but certainly there's something very powerful. The, it's the, we burst into song because we, we glimpse a paradise and then we realize we're not worthy to receive that. Um, 
and uh, they're just something, you know, sort of deeply human, deeply universal about that experience. Um, Roseanne wants to know, she says, are the flower prophe prophecies the motivation for those millions of conversions? Is that your main point? How would you describe your main point? Yes, and, and I think we have to, I, I think there's a, a, a misunderstanding. You know, prophecy doesn't always mean just prediction. You know, where, where something is written down, where it says, okay, this future event is going to occur, and then it's fulfilled, like the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament uh, prophets pointing to the Messiah. Yes, that is prophecy, but Catholic uh, understanding of prophecy is any way in which God is trying to speak to his people. Revealing himself. Reveals himself to his people so that he can bring his people to <laughs> That's a broader, so it's not like saying, you know, okay, here's a message and this is going to happen in this year or something like mm -hmm. that. So what we're what what we make the case for is that prophecy was laid out in metaphors, in symbols, in typology, and another thing called prefigurement, that all these symbols, metaphors, and concepts and ideas that were laid out in ancient Mesoamerica were prophetical because they eventually they were filled. This would also include the song poems. They were fulfilled through the Guadalupe, Guadalupe narrative in, once again, prefigurement of certain ideas, metaphors, symbols, and typology. Mm -hmm. And that these connections would have mm -hmm. led to the millions of conversions. You know, Pope, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth said that the uh, meeting of Jerusalem and Athens was not an accident by which it, it struck many of the early church fathers how certain Greek philosophers prefigured certain Christian ideas, right? Yes. So I think you're saying rather than that the flower prophecies were the motivation, th that the, the deeply implanted desire for paradise combined with the impossibility of ever achieving it, it was the lifting of that blockage, right? That that we have the vision of, of paradise, but we can't get there. And suddenly there was a way to get to the paradise. And that was what made it so, the Our Lady's appearance so powerful. Am I getting that right? Absolutely. I Did we go into evangelical preparation? We didn't talk about it too much, but... Um... Well, e was... evangelical preparation or preparatio evangelica in Latin is accepted Christian doctrine. It was coined by Eusebius in the third century. And essentially what it means is that a pagan culture can be prepared uh, to, to eventually receive the gospel message when it is finally presented to them. So it's a common thing that God will, will actually be a good teacher Things won't just spring upon a culture. Very or, conscientious. Yes. There's, <laughs> as I said, the bread comes. The breadcrumbs are already there, and they will have. And once the gospel message is presented, it, they will be able to make cross that bridge, and and convert to convert to Christianity. So JC says, need some advice. How do we respond to claims that Marian apparitions are folk tales or fabrications? What do you What do you say when someone tells you that? Well, I'll say a little bit and then I'll tee it off to Joseph. But I, I think in the beginning when we started doing presentations, we started looking at all the different oppositions, like he was saying, and wondering how do we answer that and kind of what we came up with. We feel like we're giving a, a three-legged stool. You know, there's the tilma, there's the conversions. And then with the giving of this other aspect, this flower world and the Nawa philosophy that was born from it. We're giving a stronger foundation that makes it very, very difficult to discount that something miraculous happened. If it's coming from a, a visual direction, it's coming from a narrative direction, it's coming from a point of prefiguration and topology and all these different angles, God has already taken all of that into consideration and has kind of laid out a foundation that is very difficult to shake. If you want to run off, well, of that. yeah, we 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 used to call it the three-legged stool. stool. Um, that that's what we're presenting because we're giving different aspects. Before perhaps the publication of our book, people really only had one thing to hang on, and that was the validity validity or non-validity of the tilma. tilma. 
So the, the critics would go after the tilma right away. And if you were able to prove that the tilma was a fraud or be able to put doubt in people's minds, then you could just say, well, of course, then Guadalupe is all, of, all a hoax. Now, we know that the question was talking more general about uh, uh, other virgin uh, apparitions. Um, but th there's so many things. I mean, if it's from a Protestant point of view, uh, they don't believe in any virgin apparitions and there's demonic. so many hills we have to get to but we try to stay stay in our lane so to speak and we just kind of talk about guadalupe but to, but to t but to tell you the truth we don't really go into all the criticisms there which are many i mean we call them legion <laughs> yeah we, I, I think perhaps people in this audience may not be aware that in the world of secular scholarship, it's a war going on right now. Mm -hmm. Everybody, books, documentaries, papers, are mm -hmm. so many are written to disprove Guadalupe. And um, yeah, I mean, and they all start from the premise that it can't be true. And so therefore they have to come up with alternative explanations. I find them really intellectually, you know, unpersuasive. If you begin by the assumption it can't be true, well then, you have a different problem to solve uh, and it really doesn't, I mean, there are explanations. Take, for example, the idea that Franciscan missionaries stumbled on these flower world prophecies and then made up the story of the Guadalupe conversion and mm -hmm. somehow 10 million people were converted by a couple of Franciscan missionaries. It, you know, I, it, it isn't the way the Franciscans operate <laughs> anywhere. There's no evidence for it. It's just a kind of desperate effort to try to deal with the cognitive dissonance. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you, you have to believe because of the apparition. People can say, well, it's a good story. I don't know if it's true. And that is one way of responding to it. But the assumption of intellectual authority that you have proven it's not true, what you've done is assumed it's not true. And then you don't have anything left to prove. So I, I'm just saying personally, I find them pretty unpersuasive. Um, I have a couple more questions here. Do you believe Our Lady of Guadalupe has, Guadalupe has a further role to play in salvation history in as in converting Islam as the crescent moon she stands on seems to pre pre prefigure this? And I would add the Archbishop was just telling us that there's a better spread of devotion to Our Lady in Africa in the in recent years. So I don't know. You got any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. You're not required to be experts in all things, including what Our Lady will do in the future, but it was an interesting comment. We've we've definitely heard about a lot of the conversions. I've been hearing about a lot of Muslims. A lot of them are having dreams within the last couple of uh, months the, over the mm -hmm. last half year. And um, I've been hearing more and more accounts of that happening and they're pretty astonishing. I mean, of course we're only speculating, but it seems to make sense that in a culture that, and we've been hearing more and more statistics that of people heading closer to embracing paganism in today's times are just completely throwing off any vestiges outside of, you know, more uh, extreme monotheism with, with uh, Muslims or Christians that majority of people are kind of throwing that off and trying to figure out what their folk culture is teaching and trying to like learn these older belief systems that it, it seems to be appropriate that Our Lady of Guadalupe would step in because she converted a pagan culture to Christianity to help people regain uh, a sense of Christianity in today's times, perhaps, perhaps. So. Mm -hmm. Dr. Isra Zari asks, were there any other interesting connections you stumble on with Nuatal or other indigenous culture that did not make it into the book? Or is oh, it, there's sorry. more in the book than has made it onto the Zoom event. So maybe um, that's a better question. Well, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, there's one interesting uh, point that, that we haven't made yet that your, the audience might like. Um, okay, so going back to the earlier song poem, the Quica Pecao, Origin of the Songs, as we said, at the end of the story, uh, it is said, the singer says, only the God of far and near in Tloke Nawake can make one worthy for the flowerwood paradise. Mm -hmm. Well, when you go into the Guadalupe narrative, after Juan Diego stumbles into the flowerwood paradise and names it by name in Xochitlalpan, I mean, excuse me, in Xochitlalpan, in when when he sees Guadalupe, Guadalupe addresses himself. She she addresses 
herself to Juan Diego. And she says, she says, she uses five terms. Mm -hmm. The third term that she uses is, I am the mother of Intloke Nawake. The God of Fire. The God of Fire. So if you connect the two concepts together from the earlier the song poem, she's really saying to the Nawat, I am the mother of the God of Fire and Near, the one who makes you worthy for the flower world paradise. But you would only know, only can know that if you knew the earlier poem. So that's just one of many connections. We have uh -huh. Path of the Sun. We have the significant the description uh, of the flower we go world, in, into depth of the, the birds, the birds, the 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 flowers, what they would have meant over time. We, you know, we, we go a lot in there. Read, read the book. Read the book. Um, <laughs> so much information. Sarah Nicholas just had an interesting comment. I really wanted to share it. She says, I had a similar experience of being unworthy, but being made worthy in Turkey. I went into the house of Mary and Ephesus and walked in and started to weep for joy and felt unworthy to be in his presence, but was made worthy to be in God's presence. Wow. Beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, is there any connections with the Pacific Islands and Maori culture with Our Lady of Guadalupe? Sarah also asks. We don't know yet, but I just began researching that because I want, I've been hearing rumors of something, uh, indicators in the Filipino culture that there was a foundation laid and as, as well as in the Pacific Islands. So I'm, I'm just starting to look into that, but I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised on one level because uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe is a sp particular patron of the Philippines and Pacific Islands as well. Okay, some people are trying to send stuff to you and I'm gonna give them my email in the chat box or you can just hit reply to any of the newsletters that got you here mm -hmm. and I will pass on anything you wanna to pass to them. Oh, that's going to Frank LaRocca and not to the meeting group chat. There you go. So that answers uh, some, what some people are doing. And let me just, I'm gonna, oh, Anselm is gone. We lost him. But we did not lose his recording. I hope there he I is. hope he comes back. He's there. Um, he's back. Okay, good. So Frank, do you want to uh, Frank and Anselm? Maybe we can speak to you for a few minutes. Um, Anselm, are you there? Can you say hello? Hello. There you go. Pop right up into the big screen here. Um, Frank, tell me a little bit about how you and this young man, this extraordinary, faithful young man, came to work together on a recording of Awe Maria. Last June, Mass of the Americas was, um, was celebrated at the conclusion of a conference on family, Why on Catholic so family low? education oh, in past. Come on, let's mute. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry, that's Anselm's line. Go ahead. Still at, at a conference in Pasadena. Uh, I'm trying to meet Lori and I muted you by accident, Frank, sorry. There we go. Can you, are you unmuted now? I there think you so. go, sorry, go ahead, apologies. Um, and in the lead up, to uh, to to that conference, I got an email um, from Anselm's mother. She had heard about the Mass of the Americas. She told me that she had uh, a son who was an excellent boy soprano, and she was familiar with the um, meditation from Mass of the Americas, which is in essence a depiction of Saint Juan Diego singing to Our Lady of Guadalupe, singing the Ave Maria to her, but in the Nahuatl language. And she sent me um, <clears throat> some videos and audio clips of Anselm singing, and I, I heard that he had a terrific voice, and I thought, this is perfect. Why hadn't I thought of, thought of this before? 
because when Our Lady addresses St. Juan Diego, she addresses him as my, my dear one, my youngest one. And so in, in essence, the, the, the posture of St. Juan Diego when he is um, addressing Our Lady of Guadalupe is as a son, as a boy. And so to have a boy's voice at, um, instantiating the music that St. Juan Diego is singing to Our Lady of Guadalupe and the song was just too perfect to contemplate. And so that's how Anselm wound up singing it. And then after the mass was over, I was talking to his parents. And um, since he's on the cusp of not being a boy soprano anymore, um, we thought that we should tr try to capture his voice for posterity singing this song. And we were able to do a spectacular recording and video at St. Michael's Abbey, the Norbertine Abbey in Southern California. And so can you tell us, uh, say welcome um, and thank you so much for sharing your gifts with us and for the glory of God. And um, what was it like working with Frank LaRocca and singing the Ave Maria first at St. Michael's Abbey, which is the recording where the show was recorded over the summer? Well, I mean, it was exciting, and I loved the piece of music. It was great to meet all of you guys, and especially I really loved the opportunity to meet the Archbishop. And, yeah. I got was... photos I got to send you. Roseanne Sullivan took photos so, um, of that historic occasion. Um, and I know he just loves the opportunity to encourage all artists, but especially the next generation, because you're the future of, uh, of Christ's church here in this world, or at least in this corner of the world, you guys. Um, was there anything about the piece that's different, or maybe it's just similar to, I know you do a lot of singing, you've had actually quite a successful career as a singer, in addition to singing for your, church, your own church, your own parish. Is there anything about the song that really strikes you as different from what else you've done or, or similar, whatever. Well, I mean, it's a very different mood, especially with the marimba. Really gives it an interesting touch that a lot of the other stuff of song doesn't really have. And yeah, and I don't know, it's just something about it. it the kind of the haunting beauty of it is what was it like Frank to work with Anselm um it was not like working with I don't know how old you were when we in September when we did it are you 14 now Anselm yes yeah um it was not like working with a 14 year old it was like working with a complete professional he had the part memorized. Um, he was ready to go from the first um, downbeat of the conductor's baton. And through all the takes, he was just, he, he was sort of the, 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 the fixed solid point in the center around which all the other musicians, these great professionals from the LA area, oriented themselves. It was really quite remarkable. Well, it's a, um, a a rich connection between uh, uh, our our resident genius and um, creative spirit, Frank and uh, Anselm, and through his the grace of God and through his parents, Teresa and Chris Decker. So that's wonderful. Um, I'm getting a lot more questions, and I want to end with the Ave Maria. Oh, so I... let me. Yeah, go ahead. Well, why, why don't Okay. Now that people have been primed for it, and then we can take some questions afterwards as well. I I think it works better to end on the highest note. That's why I'm gonna just loop back. And Selm, do you sing at St. Andrew Church in Pasadena? Do you want to share that with us? Yeah. Um I sing there's a children's choir at my parish, and we sing uh twice a month, the first and third Sunday of every month. 
We also have a concert this Saturday at the same uh, church. So, yeah. So if you're in Pasadena area, you can you can experience uh, the beauty there too. There's a couple of questions. There's a question about why Our Lady's, the parish only celebrates Our Lady of Guadalupe with the Latino parish. The only thing I want to say about that is, Frank, one thing about the Ave Maria and the Mass of the Americas is that it's been a great device for uniting the Anglo and Latino communities as well as other uh, ethnic identities in Absolutely. one celebration to Our Lady. And is that something you thought about when you were making it? That's That, that was the principal focus of composing that Mass, um, following the, um, the inspiration of Archbishop Corleone to create a Mass that, through the incorporation of the popular tune La Guadalupana, into the elevated sacred language of the um, churches um, uh, of, of the church's uh, great treasury of music um, that any artificial divisions or distinctions or separateness between these two worlds could be dissolved and that's one of the great one of the great mysteries and beauties of the arts is that <clears throat> you get beyond uh, you you get beyond chit chat and 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 verbal um, verbal knots and just cut right to the heart of things. There's a question, which is, is the book available in Spanish? And I know Joseph and Monique were telling me that Sophia Institute declined to publish it in Spanish and they now own the rights and they're looking, they've established a GoFundMe because they need to raise a little money for a translator, et cetera. Do you want to put that in the chat box, uh, how people can contribute to creating a Spanish edition? Um, and I'm sure if you keep going on the best-selling list, there's some chance that you can sell it back to Sophia Institute or another. So I'm very excited that the book is doing well. It's a beautiful, important book. So um, the last question I'm going to take, and then we're going to go and we're going to experience the flower world paradise for real. Um, and uh, she's, uh, Teresa, feel free to post a link to your artwork on Our Lady of Guadalupe, that's Anselm's mother, um, uh, in the chat box while I get to this last question. So I thought it was really interesting. Bernadette asks, what I find exciting is that your book can help us establish a true American Catholic identity that we can say we own. I think the continental American Catholic identity needs very much the boost of confidence that your book will help. Could you comment on this exciting possibility? Joseph and... Right, absolutely. You know, we, um, we, we, we came across this discovery we found that it had uh, so many parallels to uh, the Nawa philosophers were very much like the Greek philosophers, mm -hmm. you know, were very much like the way in which God has, <clears throat> where you see his providence or his providential hand happening all across the world. So it's, it's definitely universal. And with what Frank was just saying a little while ago, that what the Nawa seem to be experiencing as artists and the way we described it in our book, he was actually able to relate to it. And, and that's the wonderful thing about musicians and music and the arts. They are universal. It is a universal language. So the other thing too, is that the aims of the Nawa to, to live in eternity with your creator for all of paradise, to live in this beautiful place of, of, of music and beauty and flowers is everyone's goal. It's it's the beatific vision. So of course it's it's everybody and and perhaps because it happened here in the Americas, we as North Americans, Central Americans, South Americans can really say 
the Virgen de Guadalupe, she's ours. She came to the Americas for us. So, so it is, we, we, could, we could feel good about that. And we could perhaps start from there and we could, we could branch out. We could, we could be able to say, okay, this is our Virgen. We, we, you know, she had a message for the people of Mesoamerica. All you have to do is accept that message. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ in your heart and to, um, and to, and to, and to desire that. So did you want to say anything? Well, just really quickly, um, jumping off of what Joseph said, while she might've started in Mesoamerica in the account itself, she actually said to have a temple built for her to honor her son so that people of all ancestries might come and honor him at there at Tepeyac. So she made it a very clear point of expressing that it was always meant to be universal. It was never meant to be just for one group of people. Um, all right, well, let us go. I'm afraid that the internet connection may not support are hearing this in the way that we would like. So I am now, Frank, I don't know if you can easily, I'm searching for the YouTube video where everyone no, no. can watch it and Joseph, having- Joseph, Joseph, Joseph we are gonna play it back from, from their hard drive. No, I know, but it's, if the internet is unstable, it will be still be, a, uh, you won't, may or may, I, 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 they're freezing up. So what, he's going to play it from their hard drive. What I'm asking is to put in the chat box, the YouTube okay. link. So everyone here, if there's any problem, they mm. can please right. copy that YouTube link and go and listen to it or right. listen to it again. There we go. Good. Excellent. Well, actually, I and uh, that I will send it uh, uh, in a email to everyone along with links to some of the articles that we discussed. All right. Um, now we're going to try some Jacker. Okay. Is everybody uh, seeing the screen? Okay. Okay. Let's try it. Yes.
you, Anselm, and thank you, Frank. Thank you, Joseph and Monique. Um, the, please uh, continue to make your comments for a few minutes in the chat room. I know uh, uh, Anselm you'll, and possibly Frank, you'll like to see the impact that your creative power working together has on people. And I hope uh, people will, it, it is there, the, the YouTube video link, share it with your friends. We, it was released on December 9th and I, last time I checked it had 1300 views and I think um, thousands more would love to benefit from hearing about this. And we, with this taste, we're all gonna go and, and learn more from your book, Joseph and Monique. And we're going to enjoy uh, watching the impact that it has as word of what Our Lady has done for us, because what she did then is what she is doing, leading us to the to the true paradise that the human heart longs for. And um, it's just been very special to be with you all today. Um, a couple of upcoming Save the Dates. Uh, February uh, 10th at Oakland Cathedral will be another chance to experience Frank Rilaka, La Rocca's Mess, Mess de Malade, honoring Our Lady of Lords on March 15th in South Miami. We will have the world premiere really celebration of the slightly adapted the Requiem Mass for the Homeless is now Requiem for the Forgotten. So that's an exciting opportunity. And if you're in the Santa Fe area and there are people from all over the world on this um, Zoom meeting, uh, a, an extremely prestigious classical music chorale, the Santa Fe Desert Chorale has just announced they're doing a program, a concert, Songs of the America, which will feature extensive selections from the Mass of the Americas, July 14th, July 27th, and August 1st. I'm trying to talk to Archbishop Cordelloni into leading a small pilgrimage down there. They've got San Miguel Chapel, arguably the oldest church in America. Um, anyway, and many more great things. And thank you all for, for your faith in Jesus and being part of the this vision that Archbishop Cordigliani has launched. And it's a privilege to be with you and I hope to be with you again. So take care, farewell. And I'm gonna try you, to Ma save all these messages. Thank you, Maggie. God bless you. Thank God you, bless Manny. Everybody. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Anselm. Anselm. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Beautiful program. And thanks, Joseph. And thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Thank God bless you. you. Guadalupe, bless you all. Okay, I'm gonna make that all black and save it all. Okay, bye. Bye bye, bye Rosanna. Hope we answered your questions. All right, I'm gonna say good night now. Thank you very much. Take okay, care. Maggie.